<laughs> Did you ever, I thought it was the last day, everyone, uh, last week. So uh, we have to do a class today. So that's fine with me. Uh, let me just see if we, our recording is recording. That's fine. And that's more. And then the host will be Brendan. How are you, Mia? You're fine, yeah. And today is Monday, August 12th. It's a holiday in Japan. It's uh, some holiday. I don't even know what the name of this holiday is. Uh, but everybody is free. Nobody has to work. So um, let me give you a little culture point if you guys are interested in Japanese stuff. Um, I told the Sunday writing class, I don't know if any of you are in the Sunday writing class, that um, this week starts the Obon holidays. You guys, uh, do you guys know Obon? No. Okay, so Obon is really ancient uh, Japanese Obon festival. It's very similar to China's uh, Hungry Ghosts festivals. And those are usually in July and August. Um, and so if you look at it, it's similar to the Chinese. Um, people go out in the street. It's called Bon Odori or Bon Festival. And they dance around this centerpiece. It's really old and ancient. Um, and they do these special dances. Um, the women wear yukata. It's the summer kimono. It's made of cotton and linen. And uh, people do the Chinese lamps that go up into the sky. But I heard they're going to stop doing these because they get kind of dangerous uh, for airplanes. Um, there's the taiko drum. We were talking about this last night because uh, one of the students, a really funny kid named Kevin, said, teacher, I can't hear you. They're practicing drums next door to my apartment. So someone was beating on these huge festival drums somewhere in Ho Chi Minh City. And that's why we were talking. This is called a taiko drum. And they bang these really loud drums as part of the festival. Um, these are traditional characters like monkeys or raccoons and they drink too much sake and so they're like the the ghosts return and they want to eat sake um in hiroshima they put these lamps into the river for the atomic bomb victims because it's at the same time and then this is the yukata do you see how these are summer weight they're really light and a lot of foreigners who come to japan um like to wear the lightweight uh, yukata because they're easier to put on than kimonos because do you see this thing is called the obi it's the wrap that's about 20 meters it's just crazy let me see 50 feet of cloth is about 15 meters of cloth you have to put around your waist so it's much easier to wear a, a summer yukata without that really long wrap in the regular kimono and then it changes from city to city like this is a special one where they have these hats and these robes so each city does something a little bit different. Um, so Obon changes city to city. Like these are the hats for another city here. And this is like really old stuff. But if you um, compare it, when I showed this picture last night, Chinese uh, Hungry Ghost Festival. Most people in Vietnam know this because they say we do this too in Vietnam. The Hungry Ghost um, are these like ghosts who return and you have to feed them money and food. Um, and they also do the lamps in the Chinese cities. Um, you give food to the hungry ghosts, like duck and chicken and apples. Do you guys know the hungry ghosts? No. No. no okay, I first saw this in Singapore. And I asked my Japanese girlfriend, this was like uh, 30 years ago, you guys, right at this time, 30 years ago. I said, what are they doing? They're burning stuff. They burn the money, you guys. Do you know where they burn the pretend money? Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah do you, I read do you guys, it in one of my books. Do you do that in uh, Vietnam, burn the pretend money? No. No? Okay. I mean, it's kind of funny. It's like the ghosts need money. <laughs> so, like, why would a ghost in heaven need money? But that's what they say. Ghost festival in Chinese culture. And uh, so you put out some sweets to... And when I was teaching in Taipei, Taiwan, this was really important. They always had these scary gods with the long beards, you guys. And I guess that's made of real human hair. They used to cut the hair off. Yeah. And there's the burning of the money. So you got to burn some money. Um, it's kind of crazy. Here's one of the dancing gods here. That looks like Taiwan. And that's in July. So Obon is just a, a week later. Here's the hungry ghost coming back. It's kind of scary. 
And so the hungry ghost comes back and they look terrible. And so here's the Buddhist guy trying to make peace with the hungry ghost. If you say, what is the hungry ghost a metaphor? For the Buddhist people, it's a symbol of all the human desires for money, power, sex, food. It's just all of our basic human instincts that can get a little bit crazy. So that's why this is kind of looks like a monster. And then this is the calm Buddhist guy. So that's uh, that's just a metaphor for that. And then people go to their hometowns uh, here uh, and then go to the fields. Oh, and then they clean um, they clean the graves. You do this in Vietnam, too, I think. Um, I'll show you cleaning family graves uh, at Obon time, cleaning the family grave. Um, so the people go to these graves and then they put water on top and they put flowers and they uh, take away any uh, weeds or plants that they don't like. And even children are encouraged to do this. They say, don't be afraid of dead people, you know, um, and here they are cleaning it. What I like is the old men sometimes bring a cup of sake and they you know the japanese wine and they put some japanese wine for the person who died um oh, it's I kind of strange that. you know that one I, yeah i know that because i watched one of my books see they have to clean this the when the plants grow wild they're called weeds w-e-e-d-s weeds and they have to clean the weeds um, and so you see this, like this was a really badly taken care of one. And this is after they made it clean. So gray matters, like take good care of your graves. But they do this in many cultures. It's not just Japan. Um, and then uh, what else? <laughs> I saw one guy, he left a package of cigarettes for his old friend. I thought that was funny. So I think the man might have been smoking. Um, and then here's a little girl cleaning like her grandmother's grave with water. They always use water as purification. Jenny, what do you think of these images? Let me ask you one by one. Uh, I think it's just... Do you think it's a good healthy thing to do? It's necessary? I think uh, maybe kind of necessary because like you show how you love your um, uh, ancestor, how you appreciate them. You yeah. It's kind of good to teach a uh, like young child to be grateful, I think. Yeah, so. yeah, really good. It's like teaching the young children um, to um, be respectful of the ancestors. It, it gives the children structure. Um, this is kind of funny. They show you a little thing, how to clean it, right? It's like an illustration, how to clean it properly, right? Japanese are always like showing you how to do it, you know, just right. Um, now, this is interesting because in Mexico, they do this on November 1st, and it's called Dia de los Muertos, Mexico, Day That's of the Dead. The Day of the Dead. Yeah, do you know that one? Yeah, I do. Because um, some of the students told me you study this in social studies in Vietnam for secondary yeah, students. I studied in I, uh, one of the apps. Yeah. So um, they, they have these skulls, you know, with these, it's really kind of creepy and weird, but they, they really love it in Mexico. Like they, they <laughs> have these parades. Yeah, and then yeah. it's... And so they put flowers all over the graves and then these skulls and these little figurines. Um, these figurines are kind of cool, actually. I used to buy some of these at a store in Hiroshima because they look so funky and strange, right? And they're handmade, but these parts break easily. And these are also for their dead spirits. And they even have this parade that gets kind of crazy. Um, they have a yeah. skull made of sugar. Oh, yeah, sugar with the skull, right? The candy skulls. Is that yeah. Mia who said that? Mia, nice. You know your Day of the Dead. Um, yeah, I know they... the Day of the Dead. <laughs> I know, it's such a crazy name, right? Edible skulls, right? So the skulls look like this. Do you know what they do with the skulls, you guys? That's kind of weird. These are candy skulls. That, and they... that is made out of sugar. And they eat what? these made of sugar. Why? <laughs> um, they, this is really a difficult sugar. question. I mentioned this... They say you're taking the dead spirit and you're putting it into your body. So it's a little bit like real primitive religion that you're taking the spirit of a dead person and you're eating it. But that's not Christianity. That's like really old 
thinking, right? And these are quite beautiful. I don't know if you can eat these ones though, but do you guys see what they do here with the head? They, you put on the head, you write the name of your grandfather or your grandmother. Like let's say their name was Maria and then you eat Maria's skull and it's like you're taking in her body energy. What do you guys think of that? Scary. <laughs> that I don't like it. My is that seriously is weird? <laughs> My house is like having having a something at my house yeah. because it moved for my yeah. grandmother's picture down mm. to the house. Like the picture is enough media you don't want to do anything weird like so here it is you can put the name of your family member on the skull and then you eat it and they say that helps you remember the dead person but I don't know you guys by the way Mexican sweets aren't very good it's almost pure sugar and the, so a lot of Mexican people have gold and silver teeth because they damage their teeth from so much sugar in the diet it's unbelievable and because it is so sweet I cannot eat it because they're a big sugar producing country. Is Vietnam a sugar producing country? Does Vietnam produce a lot of sugar? No, I don't think so. Uh, and cleaning the family grave. So they also clean the family grave like the Japanese do, Vietnam does, um, China does. You go to the grave and you put flowers and you clean it. You clean it just to respect the, the person who died. And so uh, Jenny was saying, this is good. It teaches respect. Let's ask um, Suvia, what do you think of cleaning the family grave? Is it a good idea? Yes, yeah. but it's not clean for a long time. Maybe the grass will. Yeah, the grass grows and grows. Yeah. yeah. And so you have to clean it yourself. So there they are cleaning it, painting it. She's actually painting the grave again. So I think it's healthy just to remember someone special like a grandmother, grandfather. And there they are with their Christian cross and there. Um, it's funny, uh, Spanish people don't say Jesus, they say Jesus, which is kind of funny, Jesus. And then here's the parade again. Now, what's interesting, I was living in Taipei, Taiwan two years ago at Halloween, and a lot of the Taiwanese ladies dressed in this makeup on, um, on Halloween day, Saturday. And it was kind of scary looking, but it looked really cool on these Taiwanese women. They really did the makeup well. So they know about that in Taiwan too. They looked more like this lady here and they were at the coffee shop with all of this. And I thought, wow, that's really crazy. And my friend, uh, Lulu Wu, one of my favorite math teachers at the high school, she said, Taiwanese women are so competitive. They're having a contest to see who has the best makeup and they spend hours and hours doing this. She, she said, Taiwan is a very competitive society you guys so they're actually having a contest to see who has the best makeup for halloween like this right let me ask you guys that question would you put on lots of makeup like that to win a contest fiona would you like to join a contest where you have to like put on lots and lots of makeup no i wouldn't you and mia wouldn't how about fiona would you try uh, that yeah why not why not? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm having means. I don't really costume some some other schools. I have never done that. I yeah. Have to, yeah, I have never done it yet. It's so yeah. weird. It looks like a school and a how to say that like a skeleton. I don't like it. It looks skinny. And yeah. Look at their their, their white face. I know. Mm. And then it's Fiona, so what do you do with this black makeup around your eyes? Don't you think that would like take two or three days? to really wash off in the shower. You'd walk around with black eyes for like two or three days. But then everyone would, everyone would know. Yeah, keep going. They'd say, oh, she went to the Halloween, she still has the black eyes. By the way, look at this little girl. Do you think she's cute in her makeup? I yeah, don't want that because yeah. my, my skin is sensitive. Your skin is too sensitive to do that? Too yeah. sensitive. I Even think so. Just one. Just something, yeah. just some makeup touch on my skin is so sensitive. Right so you use the word, are you ready to learn a vocabulary word, Mia? Irritation, the irritation. Here, I'll put it in chat, you guys. So you say, my skin is irritable. My skin is easily irritated, means you can't do something like that. So you guys, there it is. My skin is easily irritated. Hey, Andrew, no. What would you like to say, Mr. Nyo? Uh, about the hungry ghost thingy from my book, why are they yeah. so scared? 
Well, this is really the weird thing, Andrew. Um, it changes culture by culture. Like if you look at this guy, this guy looks genuinely scary with that black hat. It looks like he would be in a horror movie. But um, if you look at Halloween on October 31st, um, and that's uh, Halloween with the cute kids and everything. Um, do you know this jack-o'-lantern on Halloween? Yeah. It, yeah. This one looks happy, right? But they can also make scary ones on Halloween. So, oh, like, the, what we call what's that? those jack o' lanterns aren't scary. All right. But the reason why they did the old scary ones is these pumpkins are from America, from North America, America and Canada. They didn't have these in Europe, but like 3000 years ago. So they um, Halloween Celtic gourds. It looked more like this. They only had a gourd, which is part of the pumpkin family. And so the um, ancient Europeans used these gourds. But um, for Halloween, these look really nice. Um, with faces are the ones I want, uh, with faces. The reason why they did these, they would put these outside their house to scare. This is what it looks like in Western Europe. So they would make this face to scare away the ghost. They wanted the ghost to go away because they thought October 31st is when the spirit world is closest to the human world. The same idea is in Asia, in China, Japan, Vietnam. They say in July and August, the spirit world is very close to the earth. So they have this idea that at certain times of the year, the spirit world or heaven gets close to earth. But in Asia, you welcome the grandfather, grandmother pack. But in Western Europe, they, they wanted to scare away the ghost. And so it's a, it's a completely different idea, Andrew, than on the hungry ghost, right? Um, yeah, like hungry ghost is hungry ghost is scary, but you're supposed to feed it to make it happy. And that's kind of what they're doing in Halloween in America and Europe is they're giving it candy, like give the children candy, but it's all meant to be fun, right? But do you see the original gourds? These are G-O-U-R-D-S, and these are candy corns. By the way, have you guys ever eaten candy corns, the little candy here? I yeah. don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. You had them in your school? Yeah. No, um, they were invented in my hometown, Chicago. Chicago is a candy center of America uh, because all these families moved from Europe, from Belgium and Germany and France, and they started candy factories. So a lot of workers worked in candy factories. And right. this is one of the things. They, these are supposed to have real honey in them, but they're pretty sugary. Who has tried these? Mia, did you try these at your school or Andrew? No. Uh, my school tries sometimes, but it's too... Yeah. International schools always give these to your kids. They're supposed to look like corn because, again, yeah. these um, festivals I'm showing you are autumn harvest. So, like, in England, they have a November 5th um, called um, Bonfire Night. Andrew, does your British school do bonfire night on november 5th no. okay no. november 5th um england I has, oh i thought you went to a british style november 5th this is what it looks like in england they build these bonfires and they say it's because um of british history that they burn all these things but this bonfire night actually goes back a long time it's very closely connected to halloween and they burn this guy his name is jack the reason why they burned Jack, what's his name? I forget his name. Uh, Guy Fox. I'm sorry, Guy Fox. Guy Fox is a real life person. 400 years ago, he put gunpowder underneath the British House of Parliament and he tried to blow it up and it didn't work. So they, um, they uh, do fireworks to celebrate that the Houses of Parliament didn't blow up. But people get into it like Halloween. The behavior is kind of bad. Uh, the young guys drink too much. So the police try to stop it. It's called Bonfire Night on uh, November 5th. But it's very closely connected to Halloween, right? So there you go. And here's Bonfire Night. And then these people write, no popery. It's, it's, a, it's a Protestant thing against uh, Catholicism. Hey, Billy, how are you? I want to say hello to Billy. Hey, Billy, how are you? Good. Thanks for coming today, Billy. We're just kind of having a casual lesson here until we get into the main lesson because um, I'm just talking about Obone. But Andrew, I want to share what you wrote here. You did your homework. Nice guy, Mr. Andrew. And so did Fiona. And so did Ann. 
oh, you know what this crazy about this, you guys? <laughs> this homework was in a different place. That's why I thought there wasn't class today. So let me uh, go to the yellow. You guys can read your work because you worked hard on it. Uh, let's read together. Tina, are you here? Is Tina here? Tina, where's Tina? I don't see Tina, huh? All right, let's see. Um, Anna, are you here? Yes. Anna, can you read Tina's homework because I can't find Tina? Can you read this for us? And it's uh, about education. Not really. I mean, they are still important to education, but there is also a problem. The problem mm -hmm. is students sometimes misunderstood these trips and they think this is not a serious lesson. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they play and doesn't pay attention to the teacher. Besides, there's all the danger for students if they are in a forest like wild animals, or maybe I'm just overthinking. But that's a fun way to educate students too. Yeah, I really like this because Tina's very casual. She says, I'm overthinking the situation. Best not to think about it too much. But see, that's what we do in debate. We kind of overthink situations. Hey, Suvia, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. No, I accidentally put <laughs> That's okay. A lot of students do that. All right. Um, here's Suvia. Suvia, would you like to read this one here? Okay. Teachers take students on field trip every semester. This is a traditional that happened for a long time. However, we still need to confirm if field trip is a good idea. So let's consider both advantages and disadvantages of a few school field trip. Advantages go first. Children can learn many useful experiments. Kids usually can rest for a day or more. In this time, they can experiment many things of places that they have seen in books or on the TV. This is better than sitting in one place and play computer games and pick up that. Another reason is during the time, teachers and students can talk and learn more about each other. This will enhance the relationship between teachers and students. Now this advantage turn. There are some people think that school field trips are too short and students won't learn anything useful for the future. And it is the truth that most field trips are too expensive. School may form the trips, but parents still have to, still have to pay for many things. Nice. Hey, Suvia, this is interesting. You said, um, I, I put it in chat, you're explaining something here. Um, better than sitting in one place all day. Let me show you, sitting in one place all day. Um, that's called sedentary, and this is a great vocabulary word for you guys to learn. Um, sedentary, S-E-D-E-N-T-A-R-Y. Sedentary means the students just sit at their desk all day and they don't get exercise, and uh, researchers say that's not healthy, okay? So, okay, so Mrs. Uh, Pham put the, uh, Mrs. Duke put the uh, debate number two with Brenda uh, from 812. Okay, that's our last thing. All right, nice work, Suvia. Would anyone like to react to what Suvia said? Suvia, I really like that part about sedentary, sitting school all day, um, because that's what really leads to boredom and the kids get bored and they don't learn well. They kind of just sit there all day sedentary. So a field trip gets the students out and moving and experiencing things. So um, there's another word that you guys might like. It's experiential, experiential. Experiential means you experience new things. It's a sensory, sensory surround situation with smells, um, hearing things, touching things. Touching things is called tactile. And so some education research shows that touching things, smelling them, hearing them, tasting them, this is all part of your education. And if you're sitting in a desk, maybe you don't have access to that. Um, in a science class last year, the teacher brought things for the boys to touch uh, from biology, um, from the forest. And so they could touch it. That's called tactile. That's kind of interesting. All right, nice, Suvia, very good. Uh, let's see, who is this is Min? This is Min, this is Min. Let's listen to Min, here you guys. So today, I'm against the motion of school trip or excursion, an important part of the student education. I'm Jenny, and now I will talk about the disadvantage of school trip. First, 
if we're not well prepared for the trip, it will become a disaster. <laughs> and it's, it's also a risky thing that some, uh, some unusual things can happen. Maybe someone will lost the group or someone can be kidnapped. And second, uh, I think it is quite good to learn on learn something from the scholarship, but it also depends on the place. Like if you go to, to the museum, you can learn something that is kind of related to the lecture, but it's not so convenient for the re real life. So I think like if you choose to go on school shift, I think you need to go on some place that you can learn some skill that is useful for daily life more. And also the last reason is students often don't take it at serious lesson. They will go crazy on the school trip because it's not like usual, <laughs> usual lesson and they will just play. So thanks for listening. Jenny, nice. I give you applause. That's really nice. What's interesting about you guys as a class is you use words to describe something. And so what Jenny was describing in point number two, I think it was relevancy. Relevancy is another great word to learn. The question is, how is this trip relevant to my education? It's from the word relate, relate to my education. How can I use this in my education? It's called relevancy. So if you guys, if you're ever like in a class with a foreign teacher, you could raise your hand and politely say, um, teacher, I'm sorry, but how is this relevant to what you were talking about yesterday. I'm a little confused, right? But be careful in the way you use it because some students are kind of mean. They go, um, teacher, how is this in any way relevant to what we're learning? And teachers can get a little bit upset if you say it wrong. They're like, what are you talking about? This, this, direct, this connects directly to what we're discussing in class, <laughs> all right? So we use relevant, use relevant or relevancy with a little bit of sensitivity, right? You wanna be careful with that word. So Jenny, that's a great point. You say, how is this school class trip relevant to our education? Um, Jenny, I put this here because this is really funny. You said, I put this in quotes because it's such a great quote. If we are not prepared for the trip, it will be a disaster. I'm laughing. Jenny, can you give us any examples of some field trip disasters you've seen or experienced? Well, like, um... I remember one time that I had a school trip and one uh, and my bestie at school, she is like, uh, is that, is that called, called car sick or something like that? Oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know what, it, sure. when, when she sit in the bus in the car, she will get sick and maybe, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that um th that day she is sitting on the bus and I sit next to her and then she starts yeah. doing like this. So I give her um yellow on the back and then she just like oh, wow. get yes. all the things she it out because she yeah. is yes, she's not so kind. Yeah. She she is also prepared but that is mm. yeah. It's, I think it's kind of a disaster. And then yeah. one time I remember a um, student in my class got lost because <laughs> uh, the, the, the place that we go is kind of big and he is not follow the class. So yeah. it's kind of get lost. And then we uh, need like uh, some time to find him. All right, I'm laughing at that one because that just came up in a paper from June. We have a student named Spooky. He's a really funny kid and he's a really funny writer on Sunday night writing class. And Spooky, I, he uses S-P-O-O-K-Y, Spooky. It kind of means scary. So Spooky uh, said that, uh, Mia, you remember Spooky, right? She's smiling about Spooky, I think. Spooky wrote this crazy story. He said, uh, do you remember Spooky, Mia? I think he was in Sunday when you took a Sunday class, Spooky. His full name is Spooky Bach. 
his mother asked me, do you think Spooky's a good writer? I said, yes, he's very good. I think he read a lot of Diary of a Wimpy Kid and Captain Underpants because he learned to write really funny stuff, Spooky did. So Spooky said, um, on their field trip, this one kid was missing and all the teachers got really upset. They thought something terrible happened. And so they were looking all over the um, park for him. And the boy was just in the toilet. He was taking too much time in the toilet. And so they said, were you sick? He said, no, I just like to spend a lot of time in the toilet. But the teachers are really upset because like you said, Jenny, did this boy get kidnapped or something? You know, did he fall down into a pond? You know, and he was just on the toilet for too long. And that's a crazy story by Spooky Bach. All right. All right, you guys. Who's playing that? Is that Mia? Mia, don't play your musical instrument. We'll save that for later. And there's that brother of yours who's maybe even more mischievous than Jenny's brother, I think, if that's possible. All right. Let's go to Ann. Always has great responses. Ann, can you please read this one here? Um, okay. School trips, um, school trips and excursions offer a significant um, educational benefits enhancing learning in ways that traditional classroom settings often cannot. Exclusions can stimulate curiosity and enthusiasm yeah. for learning by engaging students in interactive and experimental activities. These activities provide students with opportunities to explore subjects in real world contexts fostering a deeper understanding and appreciation. For instance, a visit to a historical site or museum can bring history, history lessons to life, allowing students to connect with the material in a creative way. While school trips and excursions offer uh, um, numerous benefits, they also present several drawbacks that need consideration. One major concern is the cost. Organizing trips can often uh, require significant financial resources, which can strain school budgets and result in additional expenses for family. This financial burden can lead to an equal access where only some students can participate, potentially widening educational disparities. Furthermore, the time spent on exclusions may detract from regular classroom instructions, while trips provide valuable learning experiences. They can also disturb, it, disturb the com continuity of academic learning. Balancing the educational benefits of trips with the need to cover core material pose a challenge for educators. In conclusion, while school trips and exclusions offer a variety of educational benefits, there are also drawbacks on those trips and exclusions. Nice, really good on. Uh, so many points here. Um, I'm gonna put something in the notes. On it's a point number two or three, you said the excursion can cost money. So kids who have the money from families who have the money can go on these trips, but some of them are really expensive. And as soon as you mentioned that, on, um, I remembered when I was in middle school because we have primary, middle, and then secondary school. So in the second year of middle school um, in April, some students could go to Washington DC from Chicago by airplane and it cost too much money. Uh, my family couldn't send me on that trip. And I was a little bit envious because I couldn't go. Um, my father drove my mother and my sister Jackie and I to Colorado to go skiing, which was pretty cool. But I was a little bit envious because I love history and Washington DC is a great history city. There's so much history there. Um, so that cost is really important on. I'm glad you put that in your thing. Hey, by the way, on, do you remember I put this in the chat? The experiential is learning through your senses, your um, seeing, touching, uh, smelling, tasting, experiential activities. Um, I almost wonder experiential activities in Vietnam for tasting. It could be you taste food, like if, you're, if your school went to Nha Trang or went to Way City, those are places with distinct cooking, right? So could you taste new food on if you go to like a new city in Vietnam? Yeah, and like I went there and the food was kind of good. 
Oh yeah, it's good food. Um, what's funny about that is, uh, in um, here's a great expression I'll teach you guys. It's called hit or miss. Hit or miss means can be good, can be bad. All right, that's all it means. Can be good, can be bad. Hit or miss. So it's hit or miss. So for the Japanese um, junior high school, the middle school excursions to other cities uh, like Tokyo and Kyoto, um, it can be hit or miss if the hotel food is good. Um, sometimes the students love all you can eat breakfast or all you can eat dinner. Um, but then sometimes they say the hotel food isn't so good. So that's called a hit or miss. It comes from baseball. So sometimes it's a miss. It's not very good. Um, what do you think? Um, we had Ann and Billy and Jenny. Um, what do you, and I want to call on some new people whom I didn't get a chance. And Lucy is here and Billy and Suvia and Tommy. Hey, Tommy, are you here? Is Mr. Tommy here? Hey, Tommy, how are you? I'm going. Tommy, has your school gone on any school excursions or trips? Yeah. Where did you go? I don't remember. Oh, you don't remember? <laughs> Wait, Tommy, your voice is too soft. Can you try one more time? You have such a cute voice, but it's very soft. Yeah. Okay, there you are, Tommy. Tommy, where did you go? Do you remember? I just remember that I have uh, go to a uh, secondary school. Yeah, you went to a secondary school to visit. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I remember we used to do that too. And so, were the secondary school students kind to you, primary school students? Yeah. Yeah. You hope that they're nice to you guys. Hey, um, Tommy, did you see anyone's older brother or sister at the secondary school? Yeah. Yeah, because they can sometimes tease the primary school students. They say, oh, that's my little brother. Tommy, did you have an older brother or older sister there at the school? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. I'm just asking. And did they give you a nice lunch? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I asked that because when I was in Taipei last year, we had um, the international school came to visit our public city secondary school, and they wanted these middle school students aged 12 and 13 to join our high school next year. So they put out a really big lunch with French fries, and our students were saying, they never give us French fries here. How come the visiting students get French fries with lots of ketchup? And so it was kind of a, a trick to make the students think that you could have French fries every day. Even some of the teachers were upset about that because they say, you know, um, all right. Who else do we have? Um, is this Fiona? Fiona, I always like your writing here. I'm looking at Fiona's, it says, it's so haunted to the nerves. <laughs> Fiona, that's really cool, actually. It's like a poetic statement within a debate. I like it, Fiona. Fiona, would you like to read it? Yeah. Sure. Of course. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I wait because uh, close to my mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my deep to my deep negative debate team. As debaters, me and my cooperative members. Um and I would like and I yeah, and I would like to declare that we're officially part of the negative team. First of all, we would like to clarify that clarify to the opponent that we don't mean to underbrate or disparage the other side. However, we are assuming our fellow opponent has fallaciously fallaciously made mis made has made yeah has made and misunderstood some school treats and. A cursing poem their speech. Well, when you're when you're at when you're at primary school, you must have been in some occasions, occasions, wasn't you? For me, I was born. I was born when I was studying at a, as at a kindergarten. We also have to demonstrate that if the school allows some kids to go camping, take a picnic, or to go to a theme park is really at risk of a risk of kidnapping and getting lost. 
are getting lost. I know it's very dramatic to call it out, but the truth is still practically truthful for some reasons. I think it's, yeah, thanks for, thanks to some teachers who are very, very responsible would never pay attention to their peers, uh, people's appeals, but I think they must be atten attentive and meticulous at in events while they were as they were students of their go 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 isn't it yeah which one is pedag pedagogical or university yeah yes that's the one pedagogic yeah it's pedagogic. To teach, just training for yeah uh-huh pedagogical nice. university for sure and certain if they're are so many students, the situation will lose control because lost cause la after a lot a large number of people, not to mention some kids in a group in a group or tornado and spoiled brats. And that's gonna be that's going to be the bad dream ever in a in a guy's life. It's so haunted who think about it. It's such a hazardous journey with an untrustworthy teacher and some garrulous guys around guys around they really get on my on my nerves and all a long lasting problem is about a bit costly price of a story but i don't think it's recorded at all <clears throat> it's not dear it's not dear at all <laughs> however if some guys studying at a school by scholarship <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> ah means they have a, a low quality that, that what happens if they don't go on a trip on a school trip with their friends imagine they are in a cl in class for full of scandals like me would would they be teased by because of their family circumstances it's not fair if they after the ostracized ostracized i think so even though they did not think as by there, if they're on the side, it's also hard work. <clears throat> I'm fed up with this one. Even though they did not do wrong, in fact, eventually we totally approve that, approve that school dreams and exclusions are an important part of a student's education. But we look, we have to look at a part, at a fact, their air, their area. They are so many, so many dangerous and wicked situations that can be can be wild the trip. So uh, do we want us go on a trip. I I think we should let uh, let people let let these guys go with their parents. <clears throat> these pretty these buddies to protect to protect them all the time, like taking care. <laughs> Well, it's maybe not even a teacher's job to take care of these wet behind the ears, guys. <laughs> but they must take care of themselves for real. Yeah, I this think so. One of the expressions you use, wet behind the ears. You guys, that means when a baby is born, they're covered in liquid. So wet behind the ears means you, you know nothing about life. So that's a great expression, Fiona. It's like they're so immature. They're like a newborn baby. It's such a great expression. <laughs> So just like, Fiona, by the way, you're a school student. Um, Fiona, let me ask you thing, a question. Do you think um, in secondary school, sometimes the boys are more immature than the girls? Oh, you have to turn on your mic, Fiona. Hi, how would, hi. How would you re to use this wet behind the ears expression? I'm wondering if you think that maybe the boys on these school excursions act a little childish? Mm, I um the, the word what we had here the, is that I find out I, I, I found out at a time that I don't know some of the facts that is not real on oh. this debate so I did find out but in fact in my class in my grammatic class, class I think there are so many what we had here yeah <laughs> for example I think I'm kind of tried this too but not not act as green, but I I can I say that I can 
confidently say that I'm not as strange as my as my bestie. As strange as. I'm gonna put a question. Uh, question. This is like a bait topic, you guys. We can talk about this for the next five to ten minutes. Question for the ladies, because Fiona brought up a really interesting point here, and we'll ask Jenny and Fiona and on and. Uh, do you think that in the early in the early years uh, of secondary school, um, the females? mature quicker than the males in general? I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a dangerous question to ask, but it, it's, you know, in this class we have Andrew and Tommy and Billy and they're still primary. Uh, Vu is our uh, secondary school student, so we can talk to him, of course. And Jenny is smiling at this question. So of course I want to give it to Jenny. Jenny, do you think that the ladies in secondary just mature faster? They have more mature behavior the first one or two years of secondary school? Mm, kind of. Kind of, yeah. It's okay. So I kind think of. like when, when you have school trip on uh, higher school, like high school, secondary school, um, maybe university is kind of be better because they like take it kind of serious. Yeah. They are more mature. I'll take it more seriously. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Guys in secondary school, American high school, secondary school, uh, who acted really bad <laughs> on school excursions, right? And there's a whole story there. That's why I asked that question. Some of the behavior on the school excursions was so bad. Sylvia, what do you think? Do you think in secondary school, the young ladies are a little bit more mature than the... <laughs> Okay. I can't see anything. Huh? I can't see anything. Oh, okay, one more time. You can check the chat box. Um, do you think the the behavior in um, on the school excursions, the ladies have a little bit more mature behavior than the boys? Uh, the boys I are... think so because most of the girls in my class are taller than the boys. Yeah, nice. So it just psychologically, it looks like they're more mature, right? So what um, Suvio just described is called a height advantage. And there's been a lot of psychology and sociology studies. Height advantages that taller people seem to have more confidence, like politicians, like the American president, Obama and Biden, even Trump is quite tall. So they have this like feeling of power because they're so tall. And so it's a height advantage. So it could be that the young ladies are taller than the boys at that age. So they just act more mature because they feel that's expected of them. It's kind of an interesting response. On, what do you think of that? Is on here? Uh, yeah. Do you think the young ladies act more mature on these school excursions than the boys generally? Uh, like in primary or secondary? I say secondary is better because primary. I'm not in secondary, so I don't know. Oh, okay. The reason I say not in um, primary is because on our school excursions, the girls and the boys equally, they were all kind of crazy. We weren't supposed to bring candy because it makes people car sick, what Jenny was saying, car sick. We all get on a bus and the bus goes up and down on these country roads to visit a milk farm. And the teachers say no candy. And sure enough, the kids are eating candy, both the boys and girls, and they get sick to their stomach. So the behavior was equally bad in primary. But by secondary, I remember the girls, um, the first and second year of secondary were pretty well behaved on our class trips where the boys were still kind of childish. We went to a Chinese restaurant with the, the thing that goes around and around. Um, let me show you that. Do you guys, it's called a Lazy Susan. It's a really funny name, a Lazy Susan. Do they do the Chinese food like this in Vietnam with a, a Lazy Susan? I have to show you a picture of this so you understand what a Lazy Susan is. Uh, lazy Susan at a Chinese restaurant. That, that weird spinning thingy. That spinny thingy, very good answer. Andrew, do they use those a lot in Vietnam? Sometimes, yes. 
Sometimes I see them. Yeah. Like not big big ones. This is it spins around and around, and the people at the table control the spinning, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's fun to eat that way, but you have to have good manners. So, Andrew, on our class trip to Chinatown in Chicago, the boys were terrible. The boys were like, I want that. And they would go like this. It's called lurch, means move it really fast. And plates would fly off of the table. And then they thought that was funny. And it was getting the Chinese waiters really angry. And it was also getting the teachers really angry. Like, stop spinning it so fast, you guys. They thought it was just a huge fun game, right? And you're supposed to be polite and eat it slowly, right? By the way, do you know the famous tofu dish in southern China? What's the name of that famous tofu dish? Do you guys know it? No. I wonder if you have this in Vietnam. It's famous in Japan because a famous uh, Chinese father and son. Um, it's called Ma, Ma Po. In Hong Kong, it's called Mapo Tofu, but in Japan, it's called Mabo Dofu. They changed the P to B, and this is Mapo Dofu. Do you guys know this tofu with hot chili spice? If it's homemade, it's really good, but most people just buy it in a pack. This is the pack kind. It's not very good, but this is the real homemade kind or in a restaurant. You see the hot chili peppers. This is really good if it's homemade. If it's made by a pack, like a mix like this for college, tofu and ketchup, it's like not good. Um, Jenny, do you guys have this in Vietnam, the mabo dofu? Because Hong Kong is pretty close to Vietnam, maybe in Hanoi. Andrew, do you guys have... Mabo dofu in, in Taiwan? I mean, in uh, North, in Vietnam? No, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Huh. Do you want to check for an English name on this? Let's check. Um, we'll go English to Vietnamese. Hey, hey, it's going crazy, you guys. I had to stop that share, and then I'll go back here to the Google Translator. And I was looking how to spell Pinocchio before, but I want to do English to Vietnamese. Let me find the name of it, and then... I don't know if they'll even have a translation. It's ma bo, uh, hey, hey, ma bo tofu. What do you guys think? No, fu ma bo. Is, is that, <laughs> Jenny, do you recognize that? No, Suvia doesn't know. Andrew, you don't know that one? Ma bo tofu. Ma bo tofu. Ma bo tofu, but the Chinese say ma bo tofu, ma bo tofu. But I, I'm sorry you guys don't have that one. That's fine. So at any rate, the boys are really rude with that table and they spin it around. Hey, Andrew, would you like to read your thing? Is it okay to read with us? I'll put it yeah. up on the screen. Yeah, because you always work really hard on these. Now, Andrew, I'm going to have to go here and then go to um, the uh, your docs. And I hope it doesn't knock me out of Zoom because it always does weird stuff when I do that. So let me stop the share with this and then i'll go back to google docs and hopefully this will work and andrew will read his work which is always high quality work andrew all right andrew can you read it there if everyone can see it yeah well, good job. trips or excursions are an important part of the student's education because they offer learning experiences outside the classroom on these trips students can see and do things they live about in books like vis visiting a museum to see ancient artifacts or going to a science center to explore hand on exhibit. These experiences make learning more exciting and help students remember what they've learned by connecting it to real life experiences. Moreover, school trips also help students develop important life skills. When they go on excursions, they often have to work together, follow instructions, and take responsibility for their own belongings. These activities teach teamwork, problem solving, and independence. Plus, school trips can be fun, uh, be fun and a great way to bond with classmates and teachers, making school a more enjoyable place to be. Nice work, Andrew. You got that hands-on. That's the tactile. You can touch things. For example, in Singapore, they have a public aquarium where you can touch starfish and all kinds of fish as long as they don't hurt you. Someone had a question that said, teacher, who said teacher? Was that Billy or Tommy or Mia? Said teacher, you wanted to ask a question or something. Who said teacher? I want to answer your question. Okay, well, think about that again. All right, Andrew, and then also um, problem solving, follow instructions. Andrew, have you ever been on a school excursion where a student forgets something important, like the students are going to go swimming and he forgets his swimsuit? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that, that happened once. Now, do the kids, 
do the other kids tease that kid i mean what's it like in vietnam do they go oh my god that's so crazy what on a trip like uh my class was going camping somewhere and then one kid forgot his bag oh my gosh so he had no sleeping bag no like so... one kid forgot his backpack so nothing he he the backpack he yeah. forgot and everything oh my gosh yeah do you guys want to hear a crazy story? About 35 years ago, the video cameras made in Japan were kind of big. And so this guy wanted to show his friends that he can parachute out of a plane really well. So he spent like a month putting this camera on his helmet. And the day that he was going to jump, he was fixing it all and everything. And it came time to jump out of the plane with his video camera on his helmet. He jumped out of the plane. And then you know what he forgot to do, Andrew? He forgot to put a parachute in his backpack and he fell to his death. And so you can see this. You could check it on YouTube. I don't want to watch it because it looks so scary. The guy, you just see him falling, falling, and he dies. And he's just foolishly, yeah. he spent so much time focusing on the camera, on the helmet, that he forgot to put a parachute in his bag. So I mean, that's just what? awful. So do you understand? What that <laughs> Right. So he was so focused on getting the camera to work on top of his helmet that he completely forgot to pack a parachute in his backpack. So he just fell. He just fell. And you see the video of him just falling. I mean, it's just so evil. But that's your story reminds me that one kid forgot his pack to go camping is pretty crazy. All right. Hey, listen, I want to ask Billy a question. Billy, are you there? Billy, what happened to Billy? Maybe he had to leave. Yeah. That's what. Hey, Billy, how are you? I'm fine. I'm good. Billy, you always have interesting things to say. Do you like your school excursions? Yes. Yeah, where did you go? Can you tell me? Mm, I go to some... Like, can I read my work to you? Please do. Did you put it in the homework? Yeah, I put it in some... Let's find it. I see Andrew's there. I'm going to find Mr. Billy um there we go billy there you are billy nice work it's nice and long all right let's do billy here it is and then so, billy you read clearly so you can read at the same time i love it. you said absolutely all right. absolutely school excursion play a vital role in education for several reasons first they provide students with hands on learning experience that go uh that go beyond the classroom. Being in a new environment allows them to engage with the subject matter in a more meaningful way. What we do is exploring nature, visiting hist historical sites, and experiencing different cultures. Seconds, excursions, promote teamwork and social skill. Students often work together in groups, which help them build friendship and learn to collaborate effectively. This social interaction is crucial for their personal development. Additionally, excursion can spark curiously and inspire students seeing real world application of what they learned in class can ignite ignite a passion for a subject and encourage them to explore further. Lastly, being out of the classroom can also be refreshing and motivating. It's break the routine and can Revigorate, revigorate yeah. students' enthusiasm for learning. Overall, schools' excursions are fantastic way to enhance education and creating lasting memories. What do you think? I think so too. You've got the same expression as Andrew: hands-on learning, making things with your hands, which really reinforces your educational experience. That if you build something with your hands. Um, it also stimulates the brain, what you call reinvigorate, Billy. Give energy to your brain, to your experience. Let me show you an example of that. When we were 10 years old, we went to uh, Wisconsin, which is about 75 miles north of Chicago. And we went into the forest with our class and we had to build 
emergency shelters like this. So if we got lost and we had to stay overnight in a forest, even with snow or really cold weather, we could build these shelters. Yeah. This is really good. Yeah. Did you guys ever build these in Vietnam? No, I never. Okay. Um, they're important even if you live in a hot country like Vietnam where there's lots of rain. Um, this would be an important thing to build in a forest because if they couldn't find you for two or three days, this is pretty good protection to keep you warm, these shelters. Ours was just, this is called a lean-to. This is a very basic one. But our teacher was pretty strict. She wouldn't let us build a bad shelter. So we really had to learn to tie knots and ropes and put this together really well. I loved it. I thought it was like such a great experience. Like, uh, in Vietnam, usually we go with school. Like it will not take us to the forest. Like it take us to, to some historic places and some popular places or even the place for children to play. Can you and build they, these? I mean, do they let you build these or do you think you're damaging? No, they will never let us in the forest because if the students are in the forest, they go anywhere and the teacher will say like, oh, where's they gone? I haven't seen them. Like, stay calm. Oh they my God. Call, but some students didn't hear. Really, they should at least teach you to make like a quick lean to. Like, that's really important. If you're in the forest yeah. for three days, it stops wild animals. You can build a fire as long as you build the fire safely. This is a great emergency survival skill. Andrew, exactly. what would you like to say? Andrew raised his hand. Wait. Is a tent better than a survival shelter? Like, wait, what if you build a survival shelter and you put a tent inside it? Is it good? This is kind of what they did here, Andrew. They have a, what's called a tarp, T-A-R-P, tarpaulin. And it's a French word, tarp. And then they um, combined it with the wood. So it's like a hybrid, right? So if you can put these two together, that's a really good one because this stops the rain and the snow really well, right? So what, like, how about the other side? It stops one side. Oh, this is open, exposed side? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, maybe that's why they put stones here, right? To keep animals out. Uh, I, I, I think they should put a tent inside, like... Like this, maybe? Yeah. That's getting no, pretty like, good. Okay. Can you go back to the previous picture? Right. Go back to the tent. Where yeah. is that previous one at? This one that one. Have. Like, they should add a tent inside. Like, they should put a tent inside, and then, like, it'll be more protected. Yeah. But did you see this other picture, though? They actually used bamboo. So this one is actually in an Asian because bamboo like that really only grows in Asia. Bamboo is incredibly strong, you guys. And of course you have lots of bamboo in Vietnam, right? So you could build an emergency shelter, but you need a machete. You guys know the machete. So you, you know, if you're going to the forest, maybe keep a machete to fight animals. Machete looks like this because you have to cut that bamboo and it's really hard. So you have to use like a big machete for cutting. Of course, it looks scary and looks like a horror movie, but you need a machete to cut bamboo. And so here are some machete ideas, right? But you, you know, you don't want to use them for violence. All right. All right. Listen, everyone, I did an extra 10 minutes. I'm sorry if you're late for other summer activities, but um, I was cleaning my desk when Ms. Duke called and said, Brennan, there really is a class on August 12th. I wasn't sure. So thank you so much for your responses on going on a class trip. If I didn't get to your response, I'm sorry about it. I'll goodbye. leave a comment. So I say goodbye to you, Tommy. Always a pleasure. And Jenny and Andrew, Billy, maybe we'll see you in debate number two or three or four. I'm not sure which one it is. But you guys do a great job with discussion. And uh, I'm really happy with this class because you guys discuss things. Bye. In Bye. So thank you, Billy. Thank you, thank you Mia. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you, Bye. Mia. Bye. 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 Anna. Bye. 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 Take care, you guys. Bye. See you, Mr. Billy. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>